So for today, we're very pleased to have Anna Ferrer from the Department of Economics at the University of Calgary uh, come uh, down and visit us, especially uh, since she's busy. Unfortunately, I just found out she's leaving our wonderful province. She'll be at the University of Waterloo next uh, fall, so we wish her well out there, of course. But just to give you some background information on her, aside from the fact she's from Valencia, Spain, she's an associate professor right now at the University of Calgary and an associated researcher at the Canadian Labor and Skills Researcher, Researcher Network, I think it is, isn't it? Researcher Network. And the Children Migration Network at some place called Princeton? Okay, good, I got that right. She, she graduated from Boston University. Jealousy on this part. <laughs> yeah, definitely. She graduated from Boston University, but her research career developed in Canada, focused on labor markets, education, and family uh, economics. Her work on the economics of education includes research on different uh, aspects of the premium attached to immigrant credentials and to the skills brought by immigrants to Canada. She's got a great paper, you and Craig, that's one of my favorite papers ever in the CJE about uh, sheepskin effects. Uh, her work on family economics regards the impact of housing on child development and the incidence of family-friendly benefits. More recently, her, focus, or her work is focused on the fertility of immigrants and its consequences for uh, immigrant integration. This work has been published in journals such as the Canadian Journal of Economics, Canadian Public Policy, the Journal of Human Resources, and the Industrial and Labor Relations Review. So, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm really, really glad that I take, I took this trip. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, labor market decisions of immigrant households. Uh, that is a tentative uh, title. It's supposed to be an examination of the family investment hypothesis, but the truth is that this is very much research in progress. So, I mean, this is a great opportunity for me to get some feedback and maybe take the paper in other directions. So, you decide. Uh, okay. I should mention this is joint work with my co-author Alicia Atzera from Princeton. Um, we have been working on a series of papers on immigration and fertility issues for a while now. So, I mean, all studies of, uh, on immigration actually have the same common um, motivation. So with, there is a search of an interest in immigration as a population in most developed countries is aging. So uh, governments are very interested in, uh, in seeing if immigration could be one, obviously not a solution, but at least one or a partial solution to the problem of uh, declining uh, labor force and what's going to happen to the welfare state. So immigration has been increasing in traditional countries such as the US or Canada, but it's also really, really uh, going up in places that are less traditional like uh, places in Europe. Spain uh, is uh, one example that comes to mind. But of course, all this idea that immigration may help sustain in the welfare state actually relies on the fact that immigrants assimilate. So all the focus, or most of the focus, is on whether immigrants successfully assimilate in the host country. The studies that look at these things actually show that immigrants recently are uh, not uh, having such a good luck. And it shows that. Um, they may have, um, so they, they are, uh, their earnings, the labor force participation is actually not as high as it was supposed to be given their characteristics. And this suggests that there is a lack of uh, integration in mainstream economy. From these studies, most of them focus on male immigrants. Uh, the reason for that, obviously, it's much easier to estimate the labor force participation or to assess the wage premium of male immigrants, and it's traditionally considered that the assimilation of women is going to be complicated, it's going to require much more data because there are other things that have to be considered, and in general, this is less uh, studied. So what our aim here was to try to fill up this gap and try to assess the immigrant uh, assimilation, so the assimilation of immigrant women, okay? So these theories of immigrant assimilation that we were talking about actually are focused or come from human capital theories. And this kind of in a nutshell, what they uh, assess is that when an immigrant enters, enters the host country, his human capital depreciates. And this could be due to a variety of issues, technological difference between the host and the home country, discrimination, or even the lack of local human capital, such as the language or some specific skills or networks. And all this leads to a skill depreciation, 
and that uh, makes that immigrants, when they enter, they are, have a hard time finding a job or they may have much lower wages than otherwise comparable uh, native-born individuals. So over time, they are supposed to overcome this discrimination, these technological differences, this uh, lack of human uh, capital, and that would actually lead to assimilation. So if these are the earnings or the traditional earnings of a native poor that we know more or less increase with, uh, with age, and we superimpose that of an immigrant that uh, arrives when he's 20 maybe, so initially he will show this sort of skin depreciation, but it is expected that over time the earnings profile, for instance, will increase and they eventually will, uh, will end up being as, uh, as productive or as integrated in the economy in terms of earnings or other measures as the native board. Of course, whether or not this, uh, this happens actually also depends on, um, on the self-selection of immigrants, but uh, we are not going to enter into that by now. But one point that is missing in this idea of how the uh, human capital of immigrants is supposed to evolve with time in the country is that immigrants may arrive as families. And in fact, in Canada, over 75% of the um, economic class of immigrants arrive already married and with children. So moving as an immigrant actually may change a lot of the uh, education or labor force decisions of individuals, and this is not taken into account in traditional models of human capital assimilation or uh, earnings assimilation for immigrants. So of all these theories that uh, actually consider the interdependence of family members, the uh, family investment hypothesis, that I will refer to it as FIH along the slides, actually uh, uh, is the one that considers this interdependence, as I said, and it kind of comes to say that in a credit-constrained household, a secondary worker, which is typically the woman, will support or finance the primary worker investment in human capital and skills. So because we know that when immigrants arrive into a country, they are very, or they are more likely to be uh, credit-constrained than similar families from the host, from the country, then, I mean, this hypothesis or this theory actually seems very suitable to explain the participation decisions of immigrant households. So this is uh, where, or the framework in which we interpret our results. So if we consider this idea that immigrant households are, have this skill depreciation they have to face when they come into the country, and at the same time that they are more likely to be credit constrained for a variety of reasons, then we can see that these two factors may be a determinant of the participation of the secondary worker or the women into the labor force. So under this kind of idea, <coughs> the predictions of the family investment hypothesis is that immigrant women are more likely to participate in the labor force or participate more hours than a similar uh, native-born women. It's also a prediction that as the spouse assimilates, gains the human capital or, um, or new knowledge of what's going on in the host country, the immigrant women participation which should go down uh, in terms of hours or maybe with uh, withdrawal from the labor force and will be closer to those of native born women. And another uh, prediction is that they may experience flatter wage and occupation profiles than similar native born women. Uh, but this uh, it relies mostly on the idea that because they are secondary workers that they, um, they wouldn't be participating otherwise, they are not interested in pursuing a career. And you know, it's our own personal um, idea that this, uh, this last prediction has uh, no much sense in, in current or modern economies. However, there are some issues that may interfere with this um, with the predictions of the family investment hypothesis. In particular, I mean, we consider the possibility that immigrant women are not secondary workers. So if their education is similar to that of men, so there is no clear reason why they should be the ones financing the, uh, their husbands or not the other way around. Or also it could be the case that their skills are more easily transferable to the host country and then they should be the ones that first enter uh, the labor force. So these are two of the characteristics that could actually go against the family investment hypothesis. 
So if, if that is the case, then they may not drop from the labor market or work less hours after the husband settles. We may see some assimilation, some increasing participation, increasing wages, increasing hours of work. Um, but they may also encounter the same difficulty that we uh, attribute to husbands uh, finding their first job. So they, it may be a difficult to start uh, working or to have that first uh, well-paid job. So they could show similar profiles or simulation profiles that their husband. So that is the, uh, the two uh, ideas that, uh, reasons that may kind of uh, change the family investment hypothesis predictions. And there is also an alternative uh, idea that we haven't explored very much in this uh, paper so far, which is that the perception of gender within immigrant uh, cultures may not support a female's active role in the labor market, regardless of the circumstances of the husband. And in that case, we may not show, uh, or we may show just low participation levels and no assimilation over, uh, over time. But again, uh, this is something that we just started considering and we don't, we are not going to explore that here. Um, so let me tell you a little bit, very little about the, uh, the evidence that we know so far. The earlier studies uh, actually found some evidence that this was true, that the family investment hypothesis predictions were kind of happening. In particular, this Dulip and Sanders for the United States and Warswick for Canada found that immigrant women are more likely to participate in the labor force. They work more hours than native born uh, women. And uh, that this seems to reduce over time somehow. It was kind of weak evidence, but that's, uh, they, could, they found that evidence. So later, Baker and Benjamin introduced a new twist into the model because uh, they realized that not um, when you compare immigrant women with the Canadian born, we, you are not taking into account the differences in the skills they have, because they come, the skills from, the, of immigrants come from another country. And you are also not considering different preferences uh, regarding uh, job, uh, the job market. So they, in order to kind of go over this, they, com they start comparing not immigrant women to Canadian born women, but immigrant women who are married to immigrants themselves to immigrant women who are married to the Canadian born. Uh, and the idea behind this is that these are uh, both immigrant women, so they will both share at least partly the preferences for work and the skills that at skills levels, but on the other hand, they, they can, the immigrant women who are married to Canadian born will actually not be as credit constrained as immigrant women married to immigrants. So this is uh, the innovation in Baker and Benjamin. Uh, still, they find some evidence that uh, the family investment hypothesis is true. However, a later study by Blau uh, and some co-authors for the United States doesn't find evidence. So there is a lot in the literature regarding the marital status, and this is, and I'm mentioning this because this is a shortcoming in our study. Canadian data doesn't have information about uh, marital status when you got married, and that is an important issue to identify, you know, when the credit constraints were in place or not. So some studies that uh, actually got and have this information uh, find very diverse evidence. So Cobb, Club, and Crossley for Australia didn't find any evidence of uh, family investment hypothesis. And Basilio et al. for Germany more recently um, find some very slight evidence. <coughs> and this last paper, Cohen, Golden, and Co-authors actually find no evidence for Israel whatsoever. So it seems that it's harder to get uh, evidence for the family investment hypothesis when your data is very good, or at least when it's new. So we are going to try to get at that also. So overall, I mean, there are also more recent studies, and the evidence is very mixed. Some studies find that these things, uh, that there is uh, some sort of family investment hypothesis going on. Some studies find nothing. But again, this is not surprising because whether or not we find evidence of the family investment hypothesis is going to be very um, idiosyncratic to the, the country we are studying because different countries have different compositions of immigrants and also even to the period because the compositions of immigrants in many countries has changed over time. And I think that is what actually makes our study interesting because not only we are going to present the Canadian case, which is very distinct in the composition of immigrants, so immigrants to Canada, uh, to Canada are highly educated, 
Uh, I think maybe more educated than in any other uh, country that receives large numbers of immigrants, except maybe Australia in recent years. And <coughs> um, I mean, this, that makes this a unique case of study. So we also can contribute because previous studies, even for the Canadian case, actually were dealing with much uh, worse data. So in Canada, most of the immigration studies are done with census data because it's the only place where you can find very large numbers of immigrants and you actually have uh, enough information to study. However, it has uh, some uh, shortcomings and um, it's not until recently when you can access the um, the private, no, it's not the private, the 20% census, sample census, that has much more information that we, you are able to get a very detailed classification of immigrants in many characteristics. In particular, thanks to uh, this new, uh, I mean, to access to the full census, we are able to construct variables for fertility that are not available in the, in the public use census data. And we also find uh, we have some new information about the, uh, the countries where the immigrant come from and the mother tongue they speak and all these, uh, these characteristics that are very important. Uh, and also, um, thanks to this more detailed information, we are able to add two uh, new dimensions to the study. In particular, we, um, we use the linguistic measures that are developed in Otsera and Pitlikova to assess the role of linguistic proximity. So I, I'll get into this linguistic measure in more detail after. But this is because we actually have access to this detailed information about the mother tongue that we can match and include this information. And we also are going to use a skill index that were developed in IMAI at all and that allow us to not control, but at least to take into account occupational information from jobs, which is typically something not done because it has, using just the occupational information directly from the census, has a lot of uh, problems. So this is going to allow us to study the skill mobility of immigrant women, which is something that has not been done before. So in terms of methodology, we are going to use Baker and Benjamin methodology. So we are going to be comparing immigrant women with immigrant um, and native-born partners, so these two different types of immigrant women. And again, the reason for that is that uh, we assume that immigrant women with immigrant partners are going to be much more credit constrained than those who are married to native-born partners. And so in order to do that, what we need is to interact the assimilation profile of an immigrant with a family immigrant status. Okay, so this equation here is just actually telling you that whatever measure we take from the labor market, Y, which is going to be either labor force participation, hours of work, earnings, or occupational <coughs> skills, is going to depend to a series of uh, common characteristics that we'll go into later, the measure of linguistic distance, and this kind of long term here, which is just actually recording the evolution of uh, the labor force, the hours of work, the earnings, etc of a particular cohort of immigrants at a particular point in time. And for um, those who are immigrants, uh, immigrant wife or immigrant husband. So we are going to have four categories or four types of couples. Uh, the native born couple in which both spouses are Canadian. Uh, the immigrant couple in which both uh, spouses are immigrant and then mixed couple. For, and from those, we are only going to be interested in immigrant women that are married to, uh, to native-born or Canadian husbands. Okay. So this um, common characteristics includes very typical um, uh, variables, such as a polynomial in age, uh, education, location, and then we'll include, of course, husband's characteristics, um, the fertility of the woman, and the source country If you have any questions, yes, ask me on the go. Can I just ask one sure. quick question? Do you look at time that they immigrated? Yeah. So okay. what we do actually is define a cohort, like you know, this group of immigrants came between 1991 and 1995, okay. and then they f I will follow them over time. Good. How did you quantify country? 
quanti in the, in the regression in the last slide, uh -huh. country of origin was, was in the in the statistical analysis? Yeah, it's in the yeah. census. So how did you actually, uh, is, that, is, there, is that a rank classification based upon sort of the economy? Oh no, these are dummy uh, indicator variables. So we have an indicator for oh. country, for areas of origin. Actually, country is not such a good. Um, so this is just the variable doesn't actually tell you anything about the country specifically. Just, just no, it's just system. an indicator. Okay. Actually, we are looking uh, um, we are looking into consider, uh, maybe using the GDP of the country of origin or some other measure, but we we are not there yet. Okay. Um, so regarding the data, we are looking to marry women. Uh, of course, that are between 18 and 45. This is because we, we cannot look into much older women because, uh, as I said, the census doesn't tell you exactly how many children the woman has had. It only tells you the number of children that live in the household. So if we start looking at, very, uh, at older women, then the children are very likely out of the house and they don't appear there, so it looks like they don't have any children. So we have been doing some studies in fertility, and 45 is kind of the, the right cutoff to, to consider, I mean, to make sure that the fertility variable is good enough. Uh, immigrants arrive as adults because we don't want to mix things with whether or not the immigrants have assimilated as children in the schools or with uh, peers, etc. They said all measures of fertility are derived from the number of children in the household, we also include this linguistic proximity index uh, that we match to individuals' mother tongue. So the census has over uh, 160, I think, different mother tongues for individuals. So this is a very detailed classification. And we match this to this uh, linguistic proximity index, which goes from 0 to 1, 1 being the, uh, the closest, so English speakers, and 0 being uh, uh, languages that have nothing to do with um, with English, that's mostly Asian languages. I think 0 0.5 is the the range of uh, an Indo-European language that uh, that is the only common uh, branch with the uh, with English. And also another important variable is, as I said, this uh, set of skills. And the reason this is important is that uh, if you want to look at the occupational skills of individuals and you just introduce occupation indicators, I mean, you can go into very detailed occupation indicators. If you go to these four digit uh, job occupations, you have, again, close to 200 um, different occupations. So it's very detailed and actually gets really at to this occupation. But this is not what we are interested in here. I mean, uh, because you may change occupations, but you know, still be using the same type of skill and you know, being paid more or less the same. So what we really want to get at is at the skills that you use on your job. And for that, what we do is to match these 200 occupations that are in the census to uh, information about the fundamental skills that each of these jobs actually requires. Okay, this is a job that's been done uh, in the occupational information network. And so that actually tells you for all these uh, occupations, which is the amount of uh, analytical skills, um, uh, interpersonal skills, physical strength skills that this particular job has. Okay, so this, uh, we are able to do this uh, matching. And we are going to focus here initially on five uh, skills, two cognitive skills, which uh, are going to, defi to define the high uh, status or high skill uh, jobs, which are interpersonal or social analyt analytical skills, and three indexes for manual skills, which are physical strength, visual, and fine motor skills. So that we are, I'm going only to show here results for physical strength because uh, that kind of summarizes the, the results. Oh, this is to show you. So this is how this, uh, the skills are derived. So these, uh, these guys go into all these occupations and they observe uh, workers at the job for a number of uh, hours or days. And what they do is that they assess, you know, for instance, for the interpersonal skill category, they assess the level of oral comprehension, written expression, uh, oral expression, all these, uh, all these attributes of the job, and you know, give them a rank 
from 1 to 7, so 1 to 7, I think. And then they also interview the workers and ask them, you know, what, whether they think that communication with super, uh, supervisors or peers is very important, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a mixture of the assessment of these persons who go and assess the job and uh, interviews with the actual workers. So from all this, um, uh, this information, they construct this, for instance, this interpersonal uh, skill index. Uh, well, this is for the analytical skill category. Again, some of them are just evaluation from the, from the interviewer or the person gathering the information, and then there are typically a couple of questions to the worker about the level of skills they think are needed in the job. So it's uh, quite a comprehensive um, information that they are collecting in this uh, occupation dictionary. So this is a very brief sample summary statistics of uh, the data we use. So and it's separated between, the, this is for women, so that we have Canadian born women and immigrant women, and then further separated by the type of partner they have. And again, we, we are looking into partners, so spouses and common law spouses, but uh, I will refer a lot of times to husbands just because it's easier, but, uh, so you know. So in general, uh, these groups are very close in age. Maybe uh, immigrants are slightly uh, older by one year. And you can see how uh, immigrants are in general better educated, particularly at high levels of education. So this is 34, 38% have more than a bachelor degree versus 20 or 28 percent for Canadian-born women. However, they are much less likely to participate and participate less hours than Canadian-born women. And again, this doesn't seem to be uh, because of age, because the, the age of these individuals are, is pretty close. So this is the, um, the skills, uh, the skill index, only four of them. So let me tell you the interpretation. So there is a zero missing here. And what this number means is that the social skill of, uh, or better say, Canadian born women who are married to Canadian born partners typically work in jobs that require skills or social skills that are 0 0.24 standard deviations above the average for the Canadian economy in 2001. So all these indexes have been um, calibrated so that they reflect deviations with respect to the average in the labor market in 2001. So these Canadian-born women or the Canadian-born women in Canadian couples are, have, are more likely to work in jobs that have higher social skills than the average, higher, slightly higher quantitative skills than the average, but much less motor and strength skills than the average for Canada, okay? So this is very similar to what we find to other Canadian women, but um, it's also not so different from what we find for uh, immigrant women that are married to Canadian-born partners, okay? But it's radically different from what we find for immigrant couples, okay? These immigrant women who have uh, an immigrant partner actually are working in jobs that require a much lower level of social skills, 0.90 below uh, uh, standard deviations below the mean of the Canadian average. Um, uh, they also work in occupations that even though they require less uh, motor and strength skills than the average, is much higher than when the other women are working in. And finally, they require much lower levels of quantitative skills. So we, one of the partial reasons for that could be maybe here in the measure of linguistic distance. Because again, uh, immigrant women who are married to uh, native-born partners are much more <coughs> likely to either speak English or speak a language that is very close to English, over 75% of them. And only a, f uh, a small fraction uh, speak languages that are uh, far removed from English. And however, immigrant uh, women in immigrant couples are less likely to, um, to speak the language or to have a language that is very closely connected and much more likely to have or to speak languages that are only very remotely connected to English, okay? 
there's a lot of uh, Asian languages and, uh, and languages like Pakistani and Hindu, etc. here. Uh, finally, this is the distribution of the sample. We don't have so many observations here, but still, because I was like, we are talking about around a million observations with all the census together. Yes. Uh, two clarifications, please. Uh, one, uh, how many uh, observations uh, are we talking about here? So we are talking about uh, slightly under a million observations. About a million. Yeah. Okay. Now, are they all uh, surveyed upon the time they just enter the market, or enter the country, or into the market, or they are actually in different stage of uh, the labor part of the market participation? So what we have here is four census years, the 1991, 1996, 2001, and 2006 census year, and they are all at different levels of uh, assimilation in the country. So what we are going to actually do is to um, to separate all these immigrants into cohorts, and we are only going to look at cohorts that have entered the country at the point that we can see them, because we are interested in recent immigrants. So let me see if the next slide is going to be, no, so this is my, so let me get back to that question when I start the, the results. So this is one of our dependent variables, hours of work, and uh, as you can see, the blue line is for the native born, and the red one is for recent immigrants. This is not actually all of sample, only immigrants that have been in the country for 10 years, but I mean, that's the story. So in, what we have is two groups, although immigrants in general are slightly more likely to work closer to 40 uh, hours than the native born, it is true that they are less likely to work uh, in this range and more likely to not work at all. And this is uh, the distribution of skills. So I saw you the mean before, but this is the whole distribution, so you have an idea about how this is uh, this looks. So again, this is uh, the native uh, born native born individuals for quantitative skills that have to do with uh, mathematics and analytical skills in general. And you can see that it's very close. Whether you are married to a native born uh, husband or partner or an immigrant partner, the two lines are pretty much the same, and it's the same when you look at physical strength. I mean, it's not only in high, in high status jobs, you may think. I mean, it's also for other attributes of the jobs. However, when you look at immigrant, um, at, at immigrant individuals, you can see a difference between those who are married to a Canadian and those who are married to another immigrant. So the blue line for those who are married to a Canadian shows that they are is slightly shifted to the side, which is the right, and the uh, meaning that they are working in jobs that are uh, require more quantitative skills than those who are married to immigrants. And it's the opposite story when you look at physical strength with uh, immigrant women with immigrant husbands more likely to work, the red line here, more likely to work in jobs that require high uh, strength skills. So we see that the nature of the jobs they do is actually quite different. So this, I am going to present all my results in graphs. I mean, tables and standard errors are in the, in the forthcoming paper, <laughs> which is not written yet. And I think if you ask me, I can tell you more or less what things are significant or not. But it's pretty obvious. I mean, nothing that is above uh, or around the one is significant, but all of the numbers are. So what we have here, for instance, is the uh, female labor force participation measures as odd ratios of uh, immigrant women with immigrant husbands, okay? We are comparing this to the standard here around one for native-born women married to native-born husbands. That is a benchmark that we are making all our comparisons to. And what this means, uh, so here is the legend, so it's maybe should be somewhere else that you can see it better. So this orange line here is the 1991 cohort. So as, um, as you were saying before, we don't actually measure our immigrants uh, kind of in a big group. So what we are doing is select immigrants who entered the country between 86 and 91 and see what they were doing you know, in 1991, five years, between zero and five years after they entered the country then we see what the same, the same group was doing 
1996, so it's the same cohort, but now they have been in the country for 10 years, and uh, here is when we observed them in 2001, they have been in the country 15 years, and finally, uh, last year of observation, 2006, they have been in the country between 15 and 20 years. So this is the, uh, what these um, graphs are telling us. And in uh, the way to interpret that, for instance, when the, 1990, the 1991 cohort entered the country, they were actually uh, slightly 80% or 0.8 times less likely to work than a native born uh, women in a native born couple. So if they are below, they are less likely to work. If they are above, they are, you know, for instance, here, one, uh, I think this is maybe one point three times more likely to work than native born uh, women. You don't like odds ratios? No, no, no. I was just saying that uh, usually economists don't use odds ratios. And of course, Susan's a sociologist, so I just mentioned she must be happy to see odds ratios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes. Good. laughs> so, this is uh, of a result. Um, so, the very basic equation with uh, basic, only basic controls for age and location, and, um, not much more actually tells you that there is nothing like what the uh, family, family investment hypothesis was uh, suggesting because, you know, women typically work less than the native born and uh, considerably less at some points and they take a very long time to reach the levels of the native born if at all. I mean, the 1991 cohort never reached the levels of the, of the native born couples. And other cohorts seem to be rich in parity, but still, it's a very slow process. Uh, once we adjust and control for things like fertility, which we know is different between native-born and immigrant women, we adjust for the husband wage, which may also be an important determinant of participation, as we were uh, postulating at the beginning, and also for linguistic distance, things look a little bit different. So not much changes for this uh, cohort, but we can see a change in the level. So now, uh, immigrant women, when they enter the country, they are slightly more, like, uh, more likely to work than before, still much less than the native of women, and they seem to progress over time. Okay? But still, th this is not the sort of clear evidence that we were expecting uh, regarding the participation, I mean, the, regarding what is implied by the family investment hypothesis. Yes? One more clarification sure. here. So you said that they, they are all from 18 to 45. Yeah. So for each census time point, those samples are all uh, from 18 to 45. Yeah. When are they, five years later, they are older, they are without. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, I mean, that could be an issue. So we have done all these estimations also looking at the cohort that ages with the census data. So we are, uh, and these results are robust to that. So even if we consider the women who are 18 to 30 or 30 something in the first census and we follow only those women over time, the results still hold. So what is special for 96 or why, why this way ahead than others? Uh, well, actually, this may have to do with economic conditions. I mean, what we think is going on is that Women who entered before 1991 actually were entering uh, under a, a different regime. So because most, a lot of changes in immigration is starting during the 90s. So these are diff a different type of women. That is what we uh, think, or that is what we are exploring right now. So for they, they have this very flat, not much participation profile, but the generations that entered after 1991 well, first of all, they entered during a crisis, the, the crisis of the 91. So this cohort of women entered between 91 and 95. So they entered at the time of high uh, economic crisis. And then things stabilized. So that could have something to do with it. I mean, we are, uh, we are still testing whether this is uh, because of the immigration changes that change the composition of immigrants or because the economic conditions that change for these immigrants but something happened during the early 90s that actually changed the labor force participation of these women. But that's what we are trying to get into. So uh, this is just to uh, include some of, the basis, some of the basic control variables, not including the, the country here. Uh, no. So I am not going to show the one with the country because actually 
using the country doesn't change anything. It looks pretty much slightly, slightly like that. The reason is that we have this language uh, distance, and a lot of the, I mean, as you said, because it's just a dummy. I mean, it's just an indicator. If we are not using the GDP or any other characteristic, I mean, actually, the language variable has much more information and is picking up all those effects, we think. So that's the reason we want to switch and maybe use GDP or something else to get more information from the country of origin. OK, so now we focus on uh, lower skilled jobs, because it's one of the ideas of the family investment hypothesis that women who are supporting their husbands are going to enter just any type of job, not a career job, but just any type of job in order to support the, uh, the husband. And here we start to see something that looks a little bit more like the family investment hypothesis in the sense that now we see that women, immigrant women uh, that participate in low status job, which by which we mean high strength job, jobs that require a lot of strength, actually participate more than the Canadian born women. Okay, so we see that. Uh, what we don't see is that that is something that kind of diminishes over time. Uh, but uh, at least you know, they are now participating more. And again, if we look at low analytical jobs, so uh, jobs in which you don't need to have a lot of uh, mathematical capability or re mathematical reasoning, analytical reasoning, again, we still see that these women are more likely to participate than the native born, and that this, trends, uh, this trend increases over time rather than uh, going down. I mean, because even if it goes down after this, I mean, it's a very long time to be supporting your husband. It is, uh, it is kind of puzzling that way. And finally, we also do what Baker and Benjamin pioneer by looking or comparing those immigrants who have a Canadian partner and those immigrants who have an immigrant partner. And we see that the patterns are somewhat different, but uh, not by much. And still, it's the case. It's true that immigrant women in immigrant couples participate slightly more than those who have a Canadian partner, but uh, again, it's not completely clear that they show any profile that is closer to the family investment hypothesis. And again, we, we are doubtful about this strategy in this case because, as I said, we don't know when these people got married. So in, in reality, we don't know when the, uh, the credit constraint was lifted for these women. So. I have a question with regards to the husband or marital status, for example, over time. Yeah. Like maybe when they came here, they were kind of married, and then throughout time, maybe they've been separated but not divorced. So did that uh, also impact on your presentation? Uh, well, it will uh, it have an impact if it's uh, divorce is happening in, uh, at a very high rate. I mean, um, I haven't seen a study of the divorce for Canadian immigrants. But uh, the other studies I've read from the states, mostly, uh, actually say that divorce is not so common. So I mean, it could affect a small number of immigrants, but it should have a huge bearing. At least I hope it doesn't, because I cannot really control for this. So yeah, because it's kind of, I think it may be also interesting to find out that over time, because of some of the cultural perceptions about divorce and the family. They may be registered or may still be identified as married, mm -hmm. although they are separated. Yeah, no, no, for sure. This this could be happening, and uh, I mean, to the extent that that is a big issue, then it's going to have an impact on these results. We want panel data, but they don't give it to us. That is the <laughs> <laughs> um, so again. This, this is uh, showing you the same thing, but uh, so this is the, the graph I showed you before with women participating in low analytical jobs. And this is how it looks when you have a native born husband, okay? So as you can see, the patterns are really, really different now. So if you have a native born husband, you are not so likely to work in low analytical jobs, not certainly for the original cohort, the 1991, that we kind of think is different, but even for new cohorts, you know, even if they work uh, in these jobs initially, they actually, uh, this participation is reduced over time. So this is what we were expecting. This is the family investment hypothesis. You know, high participation support entry and that diminishes over time, but this is the wrong group to be showing this pattern. <laughs> so uh, again, it's very puzzling 
because you know immigrant women are actually staying in those low analytical jobs. So again, these are the predictions. I won't go over those again. My attempt to lengthen the presentation. <laughs> so. So far, we don't find strong evidence or much evidence supporting the family investment hypothesis. Uh, no high participation that diminishes over time. The only group that exhibits this sort of pattern is the wrong group. Not much difference between women and um, in immigrant and mixed couples. So, I mean, this makes us turn to our previous consideration that maybe these are not secondary workers that are there to support their husband, particularly the fact that they are not withdrawing or working less over time. So maybe these women are also themselves highly educated, which we know from the, uh, from the literature and the summary statistics, and they have trouble entering the labor force, so we don't see this high participation at the beginning. But they do not leave the labor so They may transition to other jobs or to other careers. So that's not going to show up in uh, participation. Yes? Uh, don't you think the difference in proficiency requirement for professional certification hmm. may affect their participation in the labor force when they newly arrive and try to work towards getting the certification because you come into which might take some Yeah. Uh, no, no, that is the, the whole idea that um, the immigrant human capital depreciates when they enter, it could be due to this. I mean, I pointed out technological differences, but one obvious is that, you know, the sort of education or the skills they are bringing cannot be used in Canada without further studying or certification. So, but they didn't want to enter into the credentialist, credentialism issue because I mean, it could be credentialism, but it could be just that they need a period of training. I mean, I didn't want to, uh, to get into any specific cause for this. I'm just using the fact that uh, the, the skills depreciate, and they need to get more skills, either through certification, or maybe through Canadian experience, or maybe through language ability. I mean, it could be any of those. I am not actually getting into any of it. Yeah, because this study you are focusing it on can Canada as a nation. Yeah. What I'm saying is the requirement differs from province to province. Mm -hmm. oh. There are some provinces where you come in, Sorry, I didn't you, get are, that. Yeah. you have equivalent certification, mm -hmm. and there are some provinces you need to. So yeah. that may play some role. Yeah, well, if there is uh, uh, issues of provincial credentialism going on, they will be in the provincial indicators. That's the best I can do with that. So we have provincial indicators, and uh, I mean, I hope that that is picking up any sort of uh, credentialism across provinces. It's, I don't know if there is any other way of doing it better. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have to leave because I have my other roles to play. But uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I have to now, actually, what you're trying to show is that uh, statistically and the economic measures that you have actually relates to other studies that shows that there are other structural barriers that actually mm -hmm. inhibit immigrant women to actually fully participate in the labor force. Mm -hmm. So it actually shows your your study complements other studies that actually referred to by Ulu that mm -hmm. you know we have this economic model that we're trying to say, but to get the fuller picture of Maybe the more nuanced, more contextualized understanding of immigrant women participation, you have to consider the fact that there are also diversity in terms of credential recognition or referral system of per provinces, as well as over time, you know, you have other, you may have linguistic distance, but how do you actually make it real in the different provinces is different. So there are many other not say non-economically measurable factors that would actually tie up with the economic measurable factors, which I can say. Yeah, for sure. So that's kind of, I think I, I'm glad that it shows there by, by, the, by the numbers, but in terms of qualitative, you know, the more contextualist basis, I think it, it, we have a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. We have a more confident picture to say that this supports our assumptions on this. So they all converge into one sort of general understanding why immigrant women have lesser participation in terms of the higher social skills, and the skills. They do stay in the labor force over time because mm -hmm. 
they are transnational travelers. They also take up the travelers here as well as the travelers overseas. So staying in the market place is important for their lives, which may not actually show on the economics model. But yeah, thank you so much. Okay, great. So you, maybe you should send me your study and then. Are <laughs> 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 you ready to open up to questions? Or you're not finished. Oh, I am not finished, but I can no, finish. If you uh, think you have yeah. enough. No, let, me, let, me just, <laughs> let me just suggest that some of you do have to go for commitments. So one sure. o'clock, we we'll let Diana finish her presentation, and then the camera gets turned off, and then we open up to questions as the usual practice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, I was just going to show you that in order to check if it's this. Uh, what we said, no, that maybe what's happening is because these women are university educated, they get into these jobs and they are just transitioning to other things. So we are looking at what's going on. Again, this is the original picture, and this is the same picture, but for university educated women. And we can see that you know these women are really working a lot. The participation in these lower skilled jobs is going down over time, but not by, I mean, by the amount you would expect. So you still have them participating in these low analytical jobs almost three times as, uh, as often as university educated Canadian women. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is the same for uh, low analytical jobs. If you compare the immigrant, those with immigrant husbands, those with native-born husband. So this is not the case for those who married uh, Canadian. Okay. For these women, kind of stay. Uh, in a relatively stable position uh, over time, around 1.75 more likely to participate in these low skilled jobs. And the other thing that we wanted to check is whether or not this uh, it changes depending on the education of the husband, because you know the basis of the family investment hypothesis actually is based that you know it's worth that the husband gets an education, gets a head, gets settled. So that is actually a much bigger payoff if the husband is also highly educated. So we repeated the exercise using only uh, uh, those cases in which the husband is also highly educated. Um, but again, we, we don't see much uh, of a difference here. It's pretty much the same pattern as when we were using the other, uh, yes, the regular the university educated females. And this is for stress, but I'm just not going to tell you. This is just the uh, resume. And I mean, if uh, we can move to questions, because the, I have more slides that show uh, weight assimilation and hours of work, but it's pretty much the same story all the time. So this is maybe the only thing that is worth showing, I think, which is instead of looking at participation, we are going to look at how the skills evolve. So are these women working in jobs that require, I mean, that the skills these jobs require is changing over time or not? Maybe they are participating. So we saw that these women actually increased their participation, but it stayed pretty much uh, the same over time. So but are the skills they need for these jobs changing? So this is what we try to measure here. And uh, here we do have the regular group of uh, immigrant women with immigrant husband. So the amount of strength that these women are actually uh, using is still higher than the Canadian uh, average, okay? But, and it doesn't look like it's going down over time. It's not the case for those with uh, Canadian partners for which it seems to be reminiscing over time. Again, family investment hypothesis, but on the wrong group of people. And this is for the analytical group and here we can see that you know females with immigrant husbands actually are doing the same type of jobs. I mean, the, the amount of analytical skills they need is actually pretty much constant over time. But you know, for those who have a Canadian partner, the amount they, they are improving the amount of um, of skills, analytical skills that they need over time. So it's the wrong group. And this is for social assimilation. And we did the same for university. And here, finally, we see that university females are actually improving slightly the situation, whether they are married to a Canadian partner or an immigrant partner. 
and those who are working in high strength job are actually reducing the amount of strength needed for the jobs, again, regardless of uh, the, part, the status of the partner, but still, I mean, this improvement seems very slight to me. Like, after 15 years, that you are still way below average, even though you started in a much worse position. So maybe some evidence of the um, family investment hypothesis for university educated women, but it seems to us that this is more telling the story that these women have or face the same problems their husbands face, so they need to get, uh, to get experience in the labor market or they need to do something that is going to make them improve their positions and they are not having uh, much luck. And again, if they went through a period in which they were supporting their, they're supporting their husbands and they, they need to start their careers, we may be talking about a very long time. So. OK, so this is my conclusions. So overall, we think that the patterns of labor force participation of our, and hours of work or wages, which I didn't show you, but they look pretty much the same, do not fit the family investment hypothesis, particularly for recent cohorts of uh, immigrant women arriving after 1991. The skill assimilation, however, does show some indications, particularly for uh, university-educated women who seem to assimilate into better jobs, and also that you know, less educated immigrants have a more flatter profile. But, you know, we still need to understand what is the role of language, what is the role of education and cultural background, and, you know, conditions in the country of origin to explain this assimilation process.